and then, uh, you know, make it to heaven. He's got a plan and, and a purpose for us, and he invites us to partner with him while we're here, here and now, no matter who you are, no matter what your age. And, and so last week, we talked about how important it is to set our sails to the Word of God, to hear God's voice, to recognize the truth of God's Word. It's never changing. It's always relevant. It's, it's, it's eternal, and it's practical as well as spiritual. And how important it is for us to be in a place like this where we can consider some of the truths of God's Word and for us to pray and anticipate God's Word. It's important. It's key. And if you want to live out God's plan for your life, the best thing you can do is tune into the voice of your Creator and the one who redeemed you and saved you and forgave you and and wants to have a relationship with you. But you know, as I thought about God's plans and purposes, I realized that there's another common thread that goes a little bit more practical and maybe beyond what you would consider more spiritual with the Word of God and the presence of God, and that is relationships. You know, you think about God's plans and purposes, and I can't imagine God's plans and purposes for my life unfolding if I wasn't willing to be in relationship. I can't imagine God's purposes for you to exclude relationships, can you? I mean, you really think about it. When you think about God's will, God's plan, His purpose, His destiny for you, you always, you're thinking, okay, where will I be and who will I be with and what will I be doing with whoever I'm with? Relationships are that common thread. No matter who you are in the room, when it comes to God's plan for your life, when it comes to God's destiny for you, wherever He wants you to go tomorrow, there's some people there and He wants you to engage with them. That's part of His purpose, whether it's tomorrow or 25 years from now, long-term vision, God speaking in into your heart, ministry, it all deals with relationships. So this common thread, no matter if you're young, old, male, female, single, married, educated, less educated, you're wealthy, you're less than wealthy, you're white, you're blue collar, it doesn't matter. Either way, how we think and how we feel and how we act and how we react toward other people, that, that's the thing that we do, that's the thing that we become, that's the, the place where God's will shows up. It rides on relationship, and need I say, the most important relationship for God's purposes to unfold in our life is our relationship with God. And as that's in sync, and that's right, and He's our good shepherd, then all these other horizontal practical relationships take on deeper meaning. So I was thinking about this, and I was, came across actually a couple of people in the church just relocated, and they moved into a new neighborhood just a week or so ago. I was talking with one of them, one of the leaders in the church, and I said, you know, you're in a prime position right now to meet the people that you're going to be living near. New neighbors, you know? And and I would imagine that we all have something in common. I would imagine that 99% of us, if not all of us, have neighbors. And uh, whether you live in a house, you live in a townhouse or a condo, or you live in an apartment, or you live in a dorm, or, I don't know, you're staying in a hotel. I mean, you've got neighbors, no matter who you are, If you're homeless, sleeping in your car, there's somebody nearby. If you're living in a mansion, there's somebody nearby. How many of you can think of some neighbors right about now? We have that in common, right? I got to thinking about this, and I got to thinking about our neighbors and and what we think about our neighbors, and what does God think about what our neighbors think about us? Start thinking about some questions, and maybe you can, as you're thinking about your neighbors and your neighborhood, maybe you can think about this. What would your neighbors say about you as a neighbor? Well, he's, he's a real nice guy. He keeps a real nice yard. She's so friendly. Man, their kids are so important to them. They seem so busy. Them, I never see them. I'm not even sure if they even live there. <laughs> oh, them over there, they're a little snooties. They're sort of stuck up. I, they don't even look my way, let alone wave or say hello or talk to me. Hey, they're real active in their church. I know their kids are well-mannered and very polite. They're Tribe fans. They're generous. They're Steelers fans. That's why we don't talk to them. (laughs) How many of you believe that God's called us to love our neighbors even if they're Steelers fans? Right, Elva? (laughs) I love you, neighbor. Pastor David and I have been thinking about this theme and how important it is uh, for us to be relevant in the name of Christ, to our neighbors. You know, it's important what our neighbors think and say and conclude about us. Not for our pride's sake, but for God's sake. And and, and can I say this? It's even more important to God what your neighbors think and say about you. 
I think it's very possible that we don't think much about what our neighbors think about us. We're in survival track. We're running here, there, and everywhere, and we're getting by. But like I said, Pastor David and I for months have been thinking about this, thinking about what the Scripture says and praying about it and practical applications, considering what other pastors and authors have said about this and finding inspiration. One of them is Brian Wilkerson. He elaborated on this theme, and, and we'll, we'll pass a few of his points along to you in this new series that we're titling Neighbor. Some of his illustrations got us thinking about people of inspiration. And, and I'll say this, today we're going to take a look at a couple of them. Um, the most obvious one that we're going to take a look at in terms of who neighbor was important to was Jesus. So if you're a page turner, Mark chapter 12, Leviticus chapter 19, that's where we'll be today. And we're going to kind of eavesdrop into a conversation that Jesus is having with some people and a specific person, a uh, about relationships. Now, uh, before we dive into the words of Jesus, I, I know that there have got to be people in the room that when they hear me, and you hear me say the word neighbor, uh, and when I say, hey, we should be good neighbors, and I say, hey, won't you be my neighbor? I know that there's, there's somebody in the room who's thinking of somebody who's like this perfect role model neighbor, and his name is Mr. Rogers. I'm not alone. Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, uh, how many of you are familiar with? How many of you watched it as a kid? Or He helped raise your children right? <laughs> with wonderful life lessons. Uh, Mr. Rogers had a program, if you're maybe a little younger, maybe you're not in tune with this. Um, his program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, aired uh, from the 60s all the way through, and they recorded through 2001, and reruns ran all the way through 2008. And, uh, you know, he was just the nicest guy, wasn't he? I mean, his, his, he'd pull a sweater out of the closet, he'd put on, you know, he'd change his shoes, put on his sneakers, the song would be playing, and over 30 years, he was welcoming children into his, his neighborhood of make-believe and introducing kids and those parents who would get kind of drawn in to all the people in the neighborhood, and he would model to us what it means to be a good neighbor, and he would take kids here, there, and everywhere, and they would meet characters and people in the, even, even the neighborhood of make-believe, Right? Remember, remember the, tro- the trolley? That would, remember, I loved the trolley. I mean, when the, as a kid, the trolley would show up. It's like, game on, man. Like we're, I'm all in right now. And, and the trolley would, would be the neighborhood trolley. would take you here, there, and wherever. And, and he would introduce you with such kindness. I, I wish our communities and our, and our neighborhoods had this type of kindness today. He'd introduce you to people like the grocer. Hey, why don't you come? And he'd introduce the grocer to his neighborhood friends and he'd take you into the stock room and explain how things work. He'd take you to a restaurant and introduce you to the waiter or the waitress and into the kitchen and you'd meet the chef and he would explain the shoe salesman, take you into the, you know, how we measure your feet and how sometimes you don't get the shoes you really want because they don't fit right. But, you know, you still have a shoe, you should be thankful. Let's go meet the, the salesman, go into the stock room and all this one, these wonderful angles that, that Mr. Rogers would, would invite us to be a part of uh, he, he, he actually passed away in February 2003. Uh, how many of you have never seen uh, the program, Mr. Rogers? Don't be shy. You just, you've never seen, really? Yeah, really. There's several people in the room who have never seen. And all the rest of us would say, hop on YouTube later and enjoy a couple of episodes of Mr. Rogers. And I think the rest of us who enjoyed the peace and the calm and the gentle spirit of Mr. Rogers would find it very appropriate to take about 60 seconds and introduce Mr. Rogers to those who have never had the privilege. Are, are you with me? Can I get an amen? Would you help me welcome Mr. Rogers to Calvary Assembly of God? And, you know, there's this peace and this calm. Mr. Rogers was like the model neighbor. Would you agree? And uh, he, he taught us, you know, true neighbors like one another. True neighbors talk to one another. We share thoughts, we share feelings, and when we do, we respect one another, right? And we do this with a very gracious and very peaceful approach. And can I tell you uh, that the peace and the grace of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood will just take you right in. And uh, I know because I watched three episodes in the last two days. <laughs> to be honest, I could have watched more if I didn't have to finish my prep. But uh, 2018 marks 50 years of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And so you may not know this, but Mr. Rogers is making a comeback. Um, there's, there's a documentary out right now. came out June 8th. Uh, has anybody seen it? I'm just curious. Yeah, was it pretty good, Heidi? Yes, we should go see it and support the cause. We should become better neighbors. Yes. 
So it's at the theaters right now. And you may not know this, but there's actually a, an actual uh, film, big screen film coming out. Uh, and Tom Hanks is starring as uh, Mr. Rogers. So kind of cool. And I think what's the cool thing about it is the fact that neighbor and being a good neighbor is being on display. And so we're focusing in on this today. I, I think Mr. Rogers is just a great role model for us in terms of who we know and we can kind of see as an example. Obviously, we have Christ. But you think about being a neighbor. Neighbor is an interesting word. You are a neighbor and you have neighbors. Neighbor is a noun. It's something you are. And it's also a verb. It's something you do. We, we, we neighbor people. We're, we are neighbors and we do neighboring. It's specific. You're thinking of neighbors right now. You're thinking of people that live maybe across the street or left or right of you, behind you, down the hall in your apartment. Hopefully you're thinking of some names. You're thinking of some people maybe that walk their dog. You don't even know their name, but you know they're your neighbor. And so neighbors specific, and it's also very broad. It's global. I mean, think about it this way. Anyone alive today on the planet has the potential to be your neighbor. Pretty interesting. The number one reason we're honing in on the word neighbor is because it was important to Jesus. And if it was important to Jesus, it ought to be important to us. So in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28, we'll go through verse 31. uh, There are some religious leaders having a conversation with Jesus. They're not all angled in a supportive way. Some of them would really like to catch Jesus saying some things uh, that are inappropriate. Maybe uh, dishonoring to God, God's word, God's commands, God's law. And they're asking questions. Verse 28 This religious leader who uh, is also uh, steeped in the law, this teacher of the law, came and heard this debating that was going on. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked Jesus, him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, this wasn't a ridiculous question. This was something that would have been thought about a bunch. I mean, who wouldn't think that? There were 613 commands, and if you were serious about honoring God and living your life your, your life right before God, you thought about the command. You thought about what was, what was most important. Things can be debated. So it was a question that the religious leader, who you could pretty much say he was steep in the law, so you might classify him as not only religious, but, but maybe a lawyer or an attorney. And every good lawyer or attorney anticipates ahead and leads the conversation. They ask questions anticipating where it will go, what answer will be given, and kind of how to, to lay these things out. So he's asking this question to Jesus. And, uh, but at the same time, it's common... It's risky because for Jesus to choose one of these commands might imply that another very important command is less important, and that can kind of corner Jesus and get him in trouble with these religious leaders as well. So this is kind of the context of what's going on, but this one specific legal religious person seems to take a personal interest and asks Jesus another question, and he asks this question above and beyond the prior questions with what seems to be some sincerity. And he asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, beginning in verse 29 through 31. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than than these. Now, it's an interesting reply that Jesus gives to this uh, Christian legal expert. He starts off with an answer that really isn't really even a command. It's more of a confession of faith, is it not? It's the Shema. It's Deuteronomy 6. This is that statement of faith. It's this declaration that there's only one true living God. The Lord our God is one. There's no one else beside Him. There's no one else like Him. He is one. His nature is one, his way is one, and his way is love. Make sense? So he starts off with what that legal expert would expect him to say, and he starts off with this safe and and fair uh, answer that kind of sets the pace for the balance of what he's going to say. And then the question was, which is the greatest commandment? Now, if I had vanilla ice cream and I had chocolate ice cream here and I came to you and I said, okay, I'm going to offer you ice cream. Which one is your favorite? Which is your greatest choice today? How many of you know you can only choose... One. I mean, you can want both because there's a close second, but there's one that's risen to the top of your priority list. And so the question was, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, the Lord our God is one. And then he says, love the Lord your God. And he explains that and expounds on that. And that wouldn't have surprised the religious leader. That's exactly what he would have expected. 
I mean, they knew the Shema. They knew uh, the prayer. They prayed every single day along these lines, Deuteronomy 6. They taught their children to do this. And then, of course, the Ten Commandments. And so this love for God is running in sync with the Ten Commandments. It's like obvious that this first part is what we ought to embrace if we're God-fearing, God-loving people. But the part that would have thrown him a bit off and kind of caused his eyebrow to raise would have been the second part when Jesus says that there's more to it. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then He says, there's no greater commandment greater than these. What Jesus is saying is this. If God's, and He says the Lord is one, that means He has one nature. His nature and His way is that of love. And everything else falls underneath the overarching unity of who God is, His nature, and His way. And that's love. So we see it like this. There's the overarching God is love. He is one in this. And then we see love God, love our neighbor, right? And, and we kind of sometimes get hung up on the fact, well, which is it? Is it one and two? Is it A and B? Is it more important here, less important there? And wh- why did Jesus say this? And so, so Jesus is addressing all of that. And he's basically helping these folks understand that It's not this, love God, or love your neighbor. It's not this and that, love God and love your neighbor, as if two are better than one. But what he's saying is this, love God, is this, love your neighbor. He's saying that loving our neighbors is an expression of our love for God. Because God is one, and His banner over us is love. So He's illustrating this. He's making it perfectly clear. I I love what Brian Wilkerson says. He says that this, he's a pastor in Massachusetts. He says, if you're not doing both, you're not doing either. Makes me think. Pauses me in my tracks. Do I really believe that? Do we as a church really believe that? Do we embrace that? Do we live that? And then he illustrated it this way. Jesus' answer can be compared to a door with two hinges. You've seen your doors in your house, and imagine them having a top hinge and a bottom hinge. And we kind of see it as um, the commands. We see, well, maybe one hinge represents love God, the other lower hinge represents love our neighbor. And, and, and we, we, if you know anything about your hinges and your doors, your doors are meant to swing, right? They're, they're meant to open and close. But if you remove one of those hinges, your door will not serve its purpose well. So if you've ever taken the pin out of one of the hinges, you want to clean it up, you want to oil it so that it functions really well. If you take one out, it gets lopsided, it gets cockeyed, there's more friction, there's more stress on it, something's probably going to break. It definitely will not reach its intended purpose. And so what he's saying is it's so similar to us when it comes to loving God and loving our neighbor. It's two. One is the other. The other is the other. We both together work in tandem to represent and honor God and our love for Him. Amen? It's not, it's not one or the other. It's not this and that. It's this is that. So we're looking at this today. The theme is neighbor and and um, loving God and loving our neighbors. And, and you know, it's in church world, we think about hinge number one, loving God all the time. It seems like it's common. We talk about loving God through respecting His Word and praying and worshiping and getting involved in ministry and, and periodic service events. We do these things and we say we do them because we love God. We're connecting with God. We're, we're growing and we're we're going to serve Him because we love God. We love God. We love God. And, and so we talk about that a lot in church, and it's common, and it's good, and we need to. But today, for the balance of the morning and the next few weeks, we want to focus on hinge number two that sometimes gets swept under the, under the rug, and that is lo- loving people, loving our neighbor as ourself. And so Pastor David and I have been praying and preparing, and so I'm going to invite Pastor David. We're going to tag team today. We're both going to share some, and I'll be back in a few minutes. But Pastor David, if you would help us break that down, love our neighbor as ourself. And uh, hey, Pastor David, won't you be my neighbor? (laughs) You bet. (laughs) I just need a sweater so I can zip it up. (laughs) Yeah, so we're going to look at that that three-part thing, right? Love as first part, your neighbor and as yourself. So let's think about love for a minute. I mean, it's a, 
That's really the heart of this, right? Notice that Jesus doesn't say, just be nice to your neighbors or be good to your neighbors or make sure you wave to your neighbors as they pull out of the driveway, right? Or make sure you return to your neighbors the tools you borrowed. Those are all good things, but that's not where he's at. He says, love your neighbor. And love is a strong word, right? I mean, we use it for our family members, the people closest to us, our dearest friends, or, or maybe the best experiences we have in life. So we say, you know, I love my wife, my kids, my, my mom and dad. We, we, that's, that's easy to say because we mean it. It's real. It's, it's close. And maybe we say of experience, you know, I love walking barefoot on a white sand beach. Or strong feelings are behind this word. And so is he really saying, you know, uh, just, uh, are, are, we, are we supposed to love people with that same sort of feeling? I mean, Jesus does a, a, a little parallel here. And he parallels loving God, which we do with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving people. And I think the parallel is you can be sure that if loving God involves our heart, loving from the heart, loving people involves loving from our heart. And that's a big ask. Are we supposed to love like this just because people live nearby us? You know, are we supposed to, uh, are we supposed to have this kind of love just because people sit near us at work or sit near us in the school room? It's a big ask, don't you think? I mean, that kind of affection, well, it is a big ask. And, and in case you're wondering, the word that is used here, the, the word love in Greek, is that sort of infamous Greek word agape. Uh, You've heard it before referred to as unconditional, sacrificial love. So Jesus is is challenging us to love our neighbors with an unconditional, sacrificial love. And I guess we've got to ask the question, when was the last time you sacrificed for the good of your neighbor? So if we're going to fulfill this command, we probably need to be able to answer that question more readily than I can anyway. Uh, so, you know, it's this sacrificial, and if you go behind the Greek word to the Hebrew word that's in the original text, it's the word ahava, and that, that's an interesting word. It means two things. It means to act lovingly toward, so you, it's an action, and it means to be loyal to, or it's an affection. So loving, as Jesus here puts it in context, in the Old Testament context, is both to do something and to feel something or think something toward other people. It's an all-involving reality. And it's a big ask, and Jesus is certainly asking. So you got to ask yourself this question. i got to ask myself, and I was certainly asking it as I thought about this week. You know, um, are you and I actively contributing to the well-being of our neighbors? Not just, not just peaceful coexistence. We're talking about active contribution to their well-being. That's what Jesus is getting at. He says, love your neighbor in a parallel to the way you love the Lord. That's not exactly the same, but the dynamics are very similar. From the heart, with an all-engaging way, are you actively contributing to the well-being of your neighbor? And, and do, you, do you have affection for the person who lives next door, uh, the barista at Starbucks, the kid who sits beside you in the, in, in the high school classroom, do you contribute to their well-being? Do you have affection for them? So, so love, it's a big ask. Love your neighbor. Whew, I'm already challenged. We should pray. No, we're going to keep going. We will pray later. So, and then he says, you know, love your neighbor. Well, who does he have in mind? Who are our neighbors? Is he talking about, you know, anybody that just might cross our path? Is he talking about anybody we might possibly see in the course of it? He's talking about everybody in the world? I mean, yikes. Uh, Well, to figure this out, maybe we should look at the original passage from which Jesus draws this quote, love your neighbors yourself. It's Uh, Leviticus chapter 19. If you you want to turn there in Scripture, I'm going to show it uh, on the screen, but there's a series of verses we're going to read. They're all in Leviticus 19. So you might want to turn there. Uh, You'll see them either way. So it's Leviticus 19, 18, from which the phrase Jesus uses first appears, in which it first appears. And and I want you to listen to it carefully. Uh, It says this. Do not seek revenge revenge 
or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now notice that Jesus doesn't even quote the whole verse. He just takes a phrase out of this verse. He just takes a little piece of the verse. And, 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 and the rest of the verse makes it clear that the people whom he wants us to love is anybody with whom we might have had a dispute. Anybody against whom we might hold a grudge. That's what the verse talks about, right? Anybody who might have done us wrong or we might be tempted to resent. So Jesus is not letting us off the hook. He's bringing us face to face with some of the more difficult people in the world to love, right? When he quotes, he's quoting from a context that makes that really clear. So our neighbors so far could be anybody that we've interact with who could possibly have gotten under our skin. Do you know anybody like that? You sure do. And hopefully one of them's not talking to you right now. I don't know. But, <laughs> but no, reality is, of course we do. We know plenty of people who could possibly get under our skin. Jesus is giving us a pretty wide, broad reach here in quoting this verse. Um, look back a few verses, you know, and and, and see it a little bit more, because it began to dawn on me as I read Leviticus 19 that what we actually have there is a long list of commands that give an answer to the question, how am I supposed to love the people around me or my neighbors, and who are my neighbors after all? So, for instance, go back to verse 10, get a little more insight into how to love neighbors and who they might be. Here's what it says. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. So hold on here. Loving your neighbor is loving people who are materially poor. I mean, it specifically directs your attention to those who are the immigrant, the refugee, the people on the margins of society, people you might not even see. I mean, the landowners wouldn't see uh, people who are gleaning in their fields after dark or after their workers had left the field. They wouldn't even see them. And, and Jesus directing our attention, or the, the, excuse me, the writer of the Old Testament, directing our attention to people we might not even see, that we tend to dismiss, that we tend to overlook. Or, 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 and, and, and he's saying we can love them. We can love them by thinking about them and maybe stewarding our resources toward them. And then verse 13 Take a look there. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. So our neighbors are anyone we might relate to personally or professionally over whom we might try to pull some slick maneuver, right? Uh, I know you would never do that, but you might. Uh, but here's the point. It's anybody with whom you might have that kind of relationship, right? Uh, people whom you might cheat in business, uh, you know, uh, on the final exam or you know, even in the softball game, you know. There's a whole bunch of people that are within easy reach. Verse, the second half of that verse, do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. So our neighbors are people who might work for us in the office and might work around your house or serve around our community. And, and real neighbors ensure that the people they work that they, they work with or work for them are treated well and paid fairly and tipped properly. So again, this is, a, this is a, a picture of who these neighbors are and how it is that Jesus and the, the Lord wants us to treat them. Verse 14, do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. So our neighbors include people who might be differently abled than we are, people that maybe we tend to overlook, or people maybe that tend to, we, we tend to feel uncomfortable when we're around them. And the Bible is specifically directing our intention to engage these people in ways that are constructive and, and, and positive. Verse 15, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Our neighbors are everyone whom we must treat fairly. 
Who would that be? Well, that'd be, that'd be again, just pretty much everybody that you can relate to. And it's irrespective of their high status and don't resent those people or their low status and don't dismiss those people without fully appreciating them. And, and this section in verse 16b kind of sums it all up before getting to Jesus' climactic quote. It says, do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. You know that repeat of that phrase, I am the Lord, is pointing out that this is important to God. This is not just nice stuff that maybe we could do so we can you know, wave happily to our neighbor. This is stuff that matters to God and therefore sure should matter to us. So our neighbors are many people, people near, people far, all those whose well-being may be affected by the way we live and the way we act, our attitudes and our actions. So it's not just those people in our immediate neighborhood, surely them, but not just them. Now, in another time in Scripture, Jesus gives us a whole parable about a good Samaritan. We're not going to read it. We might come to it later, where he makes it very clear that neighbors uh, uh, show themselves to be neighbors by caring for anybody that comes across their path, especially those who are in need. So neighboring is a, it comprises a whole lot of people. It involves people in social proximity, that is, you know, our immediate neighbors, geographic proximity, people who are nearby, I mean, I'm sorry, social proximity, the people that we connect with, geographic proximity, the people we live near, and even virtual proximity, we're talking the internet. So we got a lot of neighbors, amen? So let me try a definition of a neighbor. Again, this is, from, uh, this is from Brian Wilkerson, but he starts out with this definition. Neighbor is any person I have the opportunity to interact with. So not everybody in the whole world, uh, just those that God gives me the chance to connect with in one way or another. But, you know, I think we can go one step further and better that definition by saying it this way. A neighbor is anyone God's to, God chooses to bring within my sphere of influence. So not everybody in the world, but those whom we can influence in one way or another. You know, some of them, the influence is great. Some of them, the influence is small. But anybody on whom we have an influence is our neighbor. It's our neighbor. And all these realities affect those relationships. We are called to love our neighbor. So... They might be the people in your immediate neighborhood. Oh, well, surely they are. They could be the barista at Starbucks or the kid who sits beside you in class uh, or the person beside you on the plane or the child you sponsor in South America, right? Or, hey, that antagonist in, on Twitter whom you're preparing to respond to. Your neighbor. Uh, and, uh, and, and, or they may be people for whom we can only are influenced by prayer, so they may be a Thai soccer team or a, a, a grieving family by the name of Coleman. We can pray for them, right? We can pray, and, and we can influence. These are all our neighbors. So, so far, what have we seen? We've seen Jesus, you know, wants us to love. Love is action and affection. Wants us to love our neighbors. That's anyone God chooses to bring into our sphere of influence. And then he says, as ourselves. So what does he mean by that? Well, we could easily sort of draw, see the connection and say, well, this is just another way of saying the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Uh, treat other people the way you want to be treated. But I think, I think there's actually a little bit more. When you take into account the Old Testament context that we've just reviewed, I think Jesus' scope is a little bit wider than that. Um, I think he's saying, you, can, there, you, you are to love the many and various neighbors in your sphere of influence uh, because those people are just like you. They're made in God's image just like you are. They've fallen short of God's glory just like you are. In some ways, they're beautiful just like you are in some ways. In some ways, they're weird just like you are in some ways. That's how it is, right? Um, and, and, 
they're people with the same hopes and aspirations and dreams. And because we are all in that same boat, they are our neighbors. And I think that's the kind of picture Jesus wants us to have. Love them not because of their status, not because of their usefulness to our advancement, not because of their shared faith, but because they are humans like we are humans. And in that sense, it's a big, it's a wide scope. They are people for whom Jesus died and for whom Jesus would have us share his love. So Jesus gives an answer to the man who questions him, right? He, he quotes two things. He says, you shall love the Lord and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer who asked this question saw the brilliance behind it. He was deeply impressed. And here's his response, verse 32 and following. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Wait! Did you hear what Jesus said to a Jewish religious lawyer? He said that, he, the, the man said, I mean, and Jesus approved that loving God and loving people is more important than all sacrifices and burnt offerings. That's entirely what first century Judaism was all about. It was all about ceremonies and proper observance of the sacrifice and doing the right thing with the right hand washing in the right place at the right time. And this man, this Jewish man, says you're right, that more important than all that is loving God and loving people. And Jesus agrees with him wholeheartedly. He sees that this man has seen something, and he says, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean? He says, you are not far from experiencing life as God intended it to be. You are not far from living under the reign of God in your life, not just in your behavior, but in your inner life and being. You're about, you're on the verge of experiencing life as it was meant to be. The best possible life there is, a life in which love for God and love for people is the essence. Basically, Jesus is saying this, that the highest and holiest thing you can do is love God and love other people. Amen? Do we get that? Do we believe that? Do we live that? Pastor Dan's going to help us. Thank you, Pastor David. Uh, you know, yesterday here in Cleveland, some of you may have been a part of the um, major impact event yesterday, the Velasano bike ride. Was anybody a part of that or participated or supported? Uh, the Cleveland Clinic hosts this event uh, every year as a way to raise funds uh, to cure cancer. And... Um, it's quite moving. It's, you probably saw, how many of you saw it on the news or online, somewhere you're familiar with, right? Well, in Boston, near Boston, they have something very similar called the, the Pan Mass Challenge. And um, Pastor Wilkerson shared an account, a story of someone in his church as he came to this understanding of loving God and loving people, both spiritually speaking and practically speaking. And uh, this man was actually one of the worship leaders in his church, and he shares this account in his own words. And, and because it's so important for us to understand what it means to love God and to love people, um, and this lesson just kind of gripped me, and so I want to just read this account for a moment here. <clears throat> Years ago, he writes, my friend Mike and I decided to ride in the Pan Mass Challenge. It's a 200-mile bike ride for cancer that begins on Saturday morning at 4.30 a.m. and ends 200 miles later in Provincetown on Sunday. On Friday night before the ride, there's always a rally. As a worship leader, I believe I have sort of a spiritual antenna that tells me when something spiritual is happening. Several times at that rally, my antenna went off, sometimes as loud as it's ever gone off. I kept waiting for the speaker to mention God or Jesus or faith or something spiritual, but it never happened. The next day on the ride, I sensed it again. At one point, there was a guy with a quilt playing bagpipes roadside while 2,000 2, riders passed by. On any other day, I would have thought it odd, but today was one of many things that sent my spiritual antenna off. 
All through the ride, there were families with cups of water and hoses greeting and cheering for us as we rode by. They made us feel like heroes. On Sunday morning, I can remember riding next to a guy who had been in the hospital tent the night before. He was still sick, but he told me that his pain was nothing compared to the pain of those cancer victims. He would ride no matter what. Shortly after that, I dropped back to be by myself, as much as you could with hundreds of riders. I remember it as if it were yesterday. I was almost yelling at God, what's with this, God? I feel you everywhere, but no one is acknowledging you. What's going on? I was somewhere between Bourne and Brewster on Route 6, and I had this thought appear in my head. It's as close as to what I hear people say is the voice of God. The thought was this, Dominic, you love the Lord your God with all your heart. They love their neighbor as themselves. You were both halfway there. I don't know how many miles I rode crying. Thank God for sunglasses. But I still get teary-eyed just thinking about it. God changed my worldview. That day, one of the most spiritually life-changing events was one of the most spiritually life-changing events I had ever had. What I learned since that bike ride is that God is everywhere and can be found among all people. Loving my neighbors and serving them is just as much a part of my worship as singing our God for oceans. And I would ask the question, is it possible that we're only halfway there? Or 75% of the way there? Or even 90% and we pat ourselves on the back? In terms of loving God, and loving people. As individuals, as a church, is it possible that as a church we're not quite there yet? We're really good at the loving God part. We're here today. We're worshiping God. We're giving Him our time. We're starting off our week right. We've read the Word this past week like the pastor encouraged us to do last week. We prayed a little bit. We came to youth group. We had our kids involved. We've done these things. We've come to church. We've done church. We've given. We've tithed. We've given the missions. We've honored God. Is it possible to do all those things, hinge number one, and not really understand or fully embrace the second part, the second hinge, that part that was so important to Jesus that Pastor David elaborated on? Loving God. God is loving people. Loving people is loving God. Do we even believe that one of the greatest things we can do before God is to love our neighbors? Do we even consider that to be a high priority? Do we order our lives that way? Do we place things on our calendar that way? Do we teach our children and model it that way? We're good at doing church, and the question is, are we just as good at being the church when we leave the place called the church, and we are called to be the church? Bringing the love of Jesus to the people in our world every single day is what God has called us to. That is the ultimate purpose. That is the ultimate destination. That is the ultimate destiny for your life and mine in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces. What would happen, Calvary Assembly of God, and every individual and every family if we did that? Think about your neighbors. Think about God's love for them. As Pastor David said it so well, neighbors are people that God has placed within your sphere of influence. The possibilities for the kingdom's advance in and through their life are endless. You and I, we don't have to see the end results. We just need to be faithful to the call of God in our lives. To love God and to love our neighbor with everything we've got. Can I ask you, do we we pray for our neighbors? Do we pray for the people we know, whether they live next door or down the street or there's somebody at work, they're within our sphere of influence. Do we pray for them? Do we even know perhaps our neighbors' names? Do we even care to know? Imagine a church where love is the way. Members really believe that the highest and holiest thing they can possibly do is to love God and love their neighbors. Yes, here in church on Sundays and Wednesday nights and in growth groups and celebrate recovery and in youth group and VBSs and outreaches to Cleveland church picnics, but also wherever life would take us every single day throughout the week, scattering every Monday, any, I would even say Sunday afternoon today. I pray we'll be that kind of church. I pray we'll be a church where God would say, those are my people and they make great neighbors. I pray that, that in our neighborhoods, the people that we know will look upon you and think about your family and think about your kindness and your ways based on who you are and what you do. And they'll say, man, those people over there, he or she, they are so kind. 
they are so considerate. They're, they're, they're the most generous and selfless people that we know. They're helpful. I'm so glad that they're in the neighborhood. I'm so glad that they live on my street or in my hall or at my apartment complex. I'm so glad I get to room with them this fall in college. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't God be so pleased if our neighbors could say, you know what, there's something special and distinct and something better about those people. I wonder why. And eventually, God could put the light on and they can recognize that the why is because you love God and you love people with everything you've got. May God help us learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. So I'm going to invite Edie to come forward with some support up here and play a song. And I'm going to give you about three minutes to do something before you leave. In your bulletin, you'll find something that looks like this. And... And it's meant to just generically represent your neighborhood. The people that live near you first and foremost, and perhaps people under your sphere of influence. And because I believe the first step in loving our neighbor, neighbor parallel with loving God, is for us to consider them and to pray for them. Would you agree with that? I mean, if we do nothing else this week, can I ask this? Can we pray for our neighbors? Shouldn't we pray for our neighbors? Amen? So as this song plays, this song is going to focus on our love for God. It's a worship song. And it also focuses on sharing God's love with other people. And and you may engage with the song. You may choose to sing. That's fine. But what I'm asking you to do is allow the Holy Spirit to just kind of woo your way through this little sheet and take a pen from the pew rack in front of you and just start to jot down the names of neighbors left and right of you, in front of you, behind you, down the hall in your apartment complex, somebody down the road. Who is God placing your sphere of influence? begin to put their names down. Let the Holy Spirit show you some ways that you can pray for them this week. Maybe there's things you just learned about them or or you know about them. For example, Thursday evening, I I met Fred for the very first time. He was walking his dog and, and I happened to be in the driveway. I've seen Fred walk down the street probably once or twice a week for two years and I didn't know it was his name until Thursday got to talking. I learned some things about his three kids and his eight grandchildren and et cetera, et cetera. And now I, I could put Fred's name on, 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 my, on my little map here and I can pray for Fred. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, will show us some ways that we can pray for the Freds in our life. And then I, I'm going to come back in just a couple of minutes once you've done this and put as many names as you can, details that the Holy Spirit drops on your heart to pray for people. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to encourage you and we're going to commit all these these neighbors to the Lord in just a couple of minutes.